Hi, I'm Maximilian Alvarez. I'm the editor-in-chief of The Real News Network and host of the podcast Working People. And I couldn't be more excited to be teaming up with the Breaking Points crew to bring you all the latest updates on workers' struggles and the labor movement and to provide what I hope will be information and analysis that you can use to take back power in your workplace and beyond. This is the art of class war. Today I want to talk to you about one of the greatest weapons the ruling class has in its arsenal, a weapon it has always known how to effectively use to keep working people down, time. At the most fundamental level, working for a wage, working to survive, means trading your labor and your time to another for compensation. That is time out of your day, out of your week, out of your life that is specifically reserved for work where the average person spends at least a third of their lives. That is also time that is surrendered to the control of someone else, someone or some entity or some algorithm that determines what your work schedule is, how much that schedule changes, and how much advance notice you get about said changes, what you do during that time on the clock, the pace at which you do it, the length of your workday, when your breaks and days off are, and even the age at which you get to retire, if you ever get to retire. Amazon workers are surveilled to Orwellian extents, getting docked for, quote, time off task, some resorting to pissing in bottles so as not to fall behind delivery quotas. Truck drivers, train conductors, and flight attendants pump their bodies full of caffeine or whatever works to keep them awake on long-haul trips. Gig companies tout the rates workers earn on the job while conveniently omitting uncompensated time spent driving between orders. Understaffed hospital workers have to serve more patients with less support, staying as late as needed to properly log every single bit of information about patients, tests, cross-department communications, and routine tasks in their internal computer systems. Teachers with packed class loads struggle to find time, often uncompensated time, for sufficient prep. Retail and service workers can hardly plan their lives outside of work or get other jobs when their shifts change sporadically week to week. While many are deliberately underscheduled as a cost-saving measure or a disciplinary measure, or both. Last year, many of the strikes and other labor actions we saw involved workers at jobs that, during the COVID-19 pandemic, experienced record demand, record profits, record increases in revenues or endowments from Kellogg's, Frito-Lay, Nabisco, and Smithfield Port Processing to Heavens Hill Distillery, John Denaire Desserts, St. Vincent Hospital, John Deere, and even Columbia University. At many of these jobs, workers reported being pushed into forced overtime to meet the increased demand, getting less time with their families, less time to rest, less time to heal, while bosses, executives, and shareholders were practically swimming in pools of money like Scrooge McDuck. In so many ways, labor's struggle is the struggle for time. Along with our bodies, it is the most precious and finite resource we have to offer. This is why, as historians frequently point out, the fight over the workday is perhaps the most common denominator connecting the different strands and iterations of the labor movement. This is why we rightly celebrate things like the weekend and paid leave as worker won victories. This is why we still remember the refrain, eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for what we will, even though the merciless, insatiable drive of modern capitalism has made it increasingly impossible for working people today to realize that centuries-old dream. Workers know the value of their time. That is why so many continue to fight for it. And that is why this fight has brought and will keep bringing divided segments of the working class together. One particular example that has been unforgivably ignored or barely covered by corporate and right-wing media, but that has thankfully been featured on breaking points many times, along with outlets like The Real News, Labor Notes, and The Valley Labor Report, is the Warrior Met Coal Strike. 
As of April 1st, 1,100 striking union mine workers and their families in Alabama have been on strike for over a year, holding the line under great duress, great financial strain, violence from scabs on the picket line, and business-friendly courts stripping their federally protected rights to picket. Again, if we're talking about time, think about how long a year actually is. This time last year, all eyes were on the first Amazon union vote in Bessemer, Alabama. A coup had just taken place in Myanmar, and Joe Biden was two months into his presidential term. The Warrior Met coal strike is already one of the longest in the country's history, and is suspected to be the longest strike in Alabama's history. And every single day has been a struggle. To mark the one-year anniversary of the day the Warrior Met strike began, the United Mine Workers of America held a rally earlier this month in Tannehill State Park. For the real news, the brilliant journalist Kim Kelly, who has hands down covered this strike more consistently and with more compassion and dedication than anyone else in the country, went to the rally to talk to workers about their year of struggle and why they won't back down. Here's a bit of Kim's interview with Greg Pilkerton, a mine worker who has been injured by company goons on the picket line who talks about his fight. I have to really look around to see what, what's going on because that, I, I'm a coal miner. And I'm not set up to be the, the Amazon worker or the, or the Walmart worker. You know, it takes them people to do their job and it takes me to do mine. So if it's not over this time next year and you, if we do an interview, I'll still be standing here. Beard will be a little longer. <laughs> but I'm still here. And that's what's important. Thank you all. Thanks for everybody to, that's done everything that they've done. It means a ton. I can't not honor my dad's legacy and the UMWA's legacy and my family legacy and my rest of my co-workers' legacies. It's, you know, it's too much too much has been given and it's been fought too hard for. So we ain't going nowhere. This time last year, when the strike began, workers repeatedly stressed that time was one of the most central issues in their fight against the company. After the previous contract was forced on the union because the previous owner of the mine went bankrupt, workers reported not only drastic changes to their pay and benefits, but to their schedules. Along with the additional hours spent just getting to the job site, driving out to the mines in the middle of nowhere and descending deep into the earth, workers described being required to work six days a week with their one day off never really being predictable. Sometimes it was a Tuesday, Sometimes it was a Friday, and for many, seven days a week was the norm. They also described a draconian four-strike attendance policy, leading workers to get fired or risk termination for any excused or unexcused absence, including visiting a spouse in the hospital. As coal miners' wives also described to Kim Kelly at The Real News, many of them have gotten used to having, quote, absentee spouses, since the new schedules changed. Unable to meaningfully live and plan their lives outside of their grueling work, miners felt deep in their bones how every day spent thousands of feet underground is a day lost as their children grow and their parents age above ground. What I have heard over and over again from Warrior Met coal workers is as heartbreaking as it is simple. Quote, we just want to see our families, end quote. The UMWA motto, which has become something of a mantra for strikers, is one day longer, one day stronger. Meaning, however long the company holds out, workers keep saying that they just need to hold out one day more. This strike embodies one of labor's most enduring and defining struggles, the struggle to control our own time. The fight over the working day and who gets to control the majority of a worker's life has been perhaps the most consistent and common driver of the labor movement 
and has been a strong unifying force bringing people from different jobs, sectors, trades, races, genders, and all other walks of life together. As Philip Foner and David Rodiger write in their book, Our Own Time, A History of American Labor in the Working Day, contrary to the varied fights by different trades and different types of workers for better wages and working conditions, quote, the reduction of working hours constituted the prime demand in the class conflicts that spawned America's first industrial strike, its first citywide trade union councils, its first labor party, its first general strikes, its first organizing, uniting skilled and unskilled workers, its first strike by females, and its first attempts at regional and national labor organization. Reduction of hours became an explosive demand partly because of its unique capacity to unify workers across the lines of craft, race, sex, skill, age, and ethnicity. End quote. So what is different now is these age-old struggles are still happening, but they are happening in a techno-dystopian 21st century in which the mechanisms for tracking, surveilling, and controlling our time are more sophisticated than ever. They are also happening in a hyper-mediated environment in which we have all been conditioned to have the long-term memories of goldfish. That's, that's what makes us such loyal participants in a digital ecosystem where we become eager data producers for an attention-based economy that needs us clicking and staring at our screens as much as possible. But that bleeds over into other parts of our brains and our hearts, too. It eats away at our capacity for long-term commitments. It makes it harder for us to sustain our attention and our solidarity and our compassion for struggles that take time, like the warrior met coal strike. In this way, the attention economy is a labor issue. Because if we continue being the kind of people corporate captured technology makes of us, if we allow it to erode our capacity for commitment without putting up a fight, we will lose. Because difficult campaigns will require years-long battles to make an impact. We have to be in it for the long haul. Commitment, as writer Pete Davis would say in his book Dedicated, is the thing we most need if we're going to start fixing this broken world. And here's the thing. Workers fighting for the respect and dignity and treatment and compensation and safety that they deserve is part of that fixing. It's a big damn part that requires sustained commitments. Because once we start going Uma Thurman and we start wiggling that big toe, once working people start building power, and as Sarah Nelson says, once workers start taking hold of the power they already have, once we stop fighting each other and start fighting for each other, once we come together in the struggle to make life better for once, that power grows. From the shop floor to the state house, working people's power to shape the world grows when we are in the struggle together. If we want to be part of that change, if we want to be a part of the labor movement, and if we want to help grow the movement for working people to have more power in this world, then we have to stay committed to these struggles. And this is exactly what the bosses and the ruling class in general desperately want to prevent. This is why they use time as a weapon. This is why the go-to strategy for Warrior Met Cole and its Wall Street investors is to wait the strikers out, regardless of how much money they lose in the process. They have seen, time and again, how effective that strategy can be, especially in the 21st century, and not just in the realm of labor politics. And I'll just give one example. In August of 2019, Democrats around the country were on every major news network calling for then-Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to push through a Senate vote on H.R. 8, a bill that had passed the House with bipartisan support in February of that year, which would require universal background checks for all firearm sales in the country. Now, the increased pressure from Democrats at the time, which was itself a response to increased pressure from scared and pissed off constituents, came in the wake of two mass shootings that occurred within one day of each other. In the first, 
Patrick Wood Crucius, a white supremacist terrorist, went on a shooting spree at a Walmart supercenter in El Paso, Texas, killing 23 people and injuring dozens more. Then, the very next day, Connor Betts shot and killed nine people and wounded 17 others in Dayton, Ohio. At that point in 2019, the U.S. Chamber um, of the Senate was in its August recess. In the days and weeks after the Dayton and El Paso shootings, congressional Democrats breathlessly called for McConnell to recall the chamber and put H.R. 8 to a vote. He didn't. Then, another deadly shooting took place in the West Texas cities of Midland and Odessa on August 29th, and pressures continued to mount. McConnell said uh, that he would only bring H.R. 8 to a vote if then-President Trump supported it. He didn't. The bill became another rotting legislative corpse on McConnell's desk. At the time, Don Beyer, Democratic representative for Virginia's 8th Congressional District, actually summed things up quite pointedly. Quote, Mitch McConnell isn't doing anything about it. That isn't because he doesn't know about the problem or how to solve it. We know precisely why Mitch McConnell isn't here. He is waiting for the outrage to die down, for the headlines to change, and people to turn the page and go on. It's what he always does. End quote. Now, I want to be very clear that this is not a segment about Mitch McConnell and the Republicans, nor is it about Democrats and the endless debate about gun control and mass shootings in America. I'm bringing up McConnell because he is probably the most recognizable practitioner of the ruling class serving weaponization of time. He can sit there and take the hits and just wait us out, and it just keeps working. But the point here is that this tactic is a staple for employers and shareholders looking to break strikes wear down unionization efforts, and demoralize workers. And you can find other examples all over the place. Kellogg's tried to sweat out 1,400 striking workers using the looming holidays and the cold weather as an additional demoralizing agent. Tenet Healthcare, the company that owns St. Vincent Hospital in Worcester, Massachusetts, tried to starve out its striking nurses for almost a year. And Warrior Met Coal is doing the exact same thing to the striking miners. They are banking on us forgetting about them. They are banking on our attention waning and our outrage dissipating. Don't prove them right. Don't let them win. What I'm saying is we all have a role to play here, but it's going to take work. It's going to take fighting against the forces that turn time against us and that in turn lead us to turn away from each other. We can't just keep excitedly jumping from strike to strike to unionization to unionization. Supporting all facets of this movement is essential. Sharing the news is important. But we also have to commit. We have to see them through. We have to be there when it counts, not just when it's trending online. I don't care if it's raising money or just bringing coffee to a picket line. Imagine you're a striking coal miner on the empty back roads outside Warrior Met Coal in Alabama. Every single sign that you are not alone in this, that other working people are with you, is enough to keep you going one day longer, one day stronger. No one has to do everything here, but everyone can do something, even if it's just continuing to demand justice for the railroad workers who are suffering under their own abusive working and scheduling conditions and who had their strike blocked by the company and the courts, as was covered before on breaking points. And even if it's just making sure that we never forget names like Evan Seyfried, Jennifer Bates, Daryl Richardson, Christian Smalls, Angelica Maldonado, Mari Cruz Mesa and Carmen Anguiano, Amanda and Jeff Frankel, Beto Sanchez and Nebretta Hardin, Hayden and Braxton Wright, and so, so many more. This isn't just about us being excited that workers are rising up, asserting their humanity, and demanding what they deserve. This is about us helping one another climb out of the pit that we've been put into by those in power. The labor movement has to be in it to win. 
because that is damn sure what the other side is trying to do with much deeper pockets and control over powerful institutions that they can use at their disposal. If we are going to win, it is up to us to carry on labor's enduring fight and to take up each other's fights as our own. We have to fight for our time and we have to fight against the way that time is being weaponized against us. And we have to do it now. Because as is always the case for every single one of us, time is running out. The days that we are here are not just abstract units of time passing by. They are precious moments of being on this earth during the one life that we get. Use them well. Thank you for watching my debut segment with Breaking Points. And be sure to subscribe to my news outlet, The Real News Network, with links in the description. See you soon for the next edition of The Art of Class War. Solidarity forever. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.